a real breadth of intended audiences for the work that the four of you have presented. Um, and especially in terms of, Frank, talking about capacity building for research, uh, but also uh, engineering programs in high schools. Just to push back a little bit, how many scientists do we really need in our society? And is the goal of all of this to create more scientists, or is it to create a different kind of citizen at the, if you can ever say there is an end to, the, to your education, at least at the end of formal education? Frank, we'll start with you and work our way this way. So at, at NOAA, and also the US Global Change Research Program, we see both. Two to four percent of the people in, in a nation are around in the STEM fields, two to four percent. Um, and you need two to four percent, maybe five. But this isn't just about them. It's about them, but it's also about the other people. So when, you, we were, when I was a teacher, we taught everybody who was in the classroom. And so it's about the citizenry and all the manifestations of the future workforce to actually implement this, plus the science and engineering and research enterprise in order to continue building on the, the excellent work that we've already done to date. It's both. Yeah, Brian? Yeah, I, I would agree with Frank here. I, when we, um, I was fortunate to be on the committee that wrote the framework for K-12 science, and one of the things that we considered from the outset is, who is the audience for this? Are we making new science and engineering uh, standards, recommendations for those standards, to grow more scientists and engineers, um, what gets called the, the STEM pipeline, or, is, uh, or are these ideas to help everyone? And the answer is both. We need a qualified STEM workforce, but we also need a citizenry that understands what science and engineering is all about, that doesn't see it as something that other people do, but see it as something that we as a community are doing um, in order to better understand our world and that can ev evaluate and understand scientific arguments, engineering arguments, and weigh in in an informed way on the decisions that we need to make as a society. Mike, I might slightly reframe the question for you to ask, is there a benefit or what is the benefit to programs like your, your Green Tech Academy for students who might not be going into a STEM field in five or 10 years? Well, I think one of the benefits is that when you look into any STEM field, there's so many different aspects of it. So for our kids, you know, it's not just about being a scientist, but I always say it's everything from the construction site to the space shuttle and everything in between and everything beyond. Um, you know, in Connecticut, we're short people installing solar panels. You know, so it's, it's everything that you need. But when it comes to being a citizen and experiencing something like this that's hands-on and something that affects your world, it spreads to every other aspect of their life. So it's STEM related, but uh, you know, I'll give you an example. With our most recent Nepal 2.0 project, our students were working on it and in the process of building and engineering the, the turbines and the earthquake happened in Nepal. And the students immediately came to me and said, we have to do something. We have to do something. This is about more than just a project now. They're our family. They're a part of us. We're going to be sending them something. And they raised almost $3,000, sent medicine, uh, sent clothing. And there are kids in that group who will not graduate from my school and go into engineering or go into science. They were a part of the project that got their interest sparked and got their ability to engage in something that was bigger than them and to engage in that learning. But it was also a piece where they learned how to be a team member, how to collaborate, and how to care about others. And that's a va valuable tool and skill across any background, much less STEM. Yeah. Jenny, especially working with very young children or targeting very young children, what's the end goal? I think um, I'm also going to fall into the camp somewhat of uh, both of the sides that uh, Frank and Brian alluded to. But I think the end goal with really young kids is um, to engage them um, wholeheartedly in learning about the world around them and their role in it. And in, in the project that we do especially, we want to give them a very gentle introduction to the climate and the things that we can do that may affect the world in a bad way, but also the changes they can make in a positive way and you know, to sustain them in that way. Do we have one quick question from the audience? Here we go. In an educational world where rigor stands out, like in my district, I'm curious about 
arguments I can respond with that this is a, a better way of teaching, even though they're not going to be prepared for the test with amino acid. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to field that one. <laughs> love to. So you're going to hear rigor. It's such a popular term in everything that we do now. And what I look at rigor is, is am I challenging my kids who are performing academically at the top level and challenging the kids everywhere all the way down and getting them engaged? And the best answer I have is when you do any sort of project, whether it's one like the one we did or a smaller one, come in and see how those kids are working and get show people how they're responding. I mean, collaboration is all over the Common Core. You know, uh, we, Brian talked about the thinking and analyzing practices that are all over the NGSS um, standards. And the big piece for me is when I brought in the partners to work with our kids and to get them their internships and work-based learning experiences, the people in the real world who are gonna be hiring my students turned and said, your kids are ready. They're on the right path. And that's a powerful tool to turn back and say, look, this is working. And you got to start small in some little way. But it helps to have someone who's supportive. You know, our superintendent, Dr. Narvez, is extremely supportive of, of what we're doing. But I, I would say start with those small victories and show them here's what the kids can do when they apply it in a real world uh, uh, sort of program. All right, a couple of quick comments from you guys. Uh, just to add to that a little bit. Um, it was rigor that motivated these STEM reforms. It's not more rigorous to just know some fancy words. The, the rigor is in the depth of reasoning, the, the ability for people to take a scientific idea and apply it broadly. Uh, vocabulary changes, facts come and go, but can students dig into those core ideas and argue with them and reason with them in depth? And that's the rigor that decades of research that preceded these reforms suggest that is achievable through these approaches. So build, building on that, there's, a, there's another piece of the rigor uh, argument structure that's going to be happening in the nation is the, the emphasis on the earth and space and environment and engineering design. These are all new to especially the high school level. And we've had a long history where the earth and space sciences have just not had the respect that it's due. And so we're talking about perhaps the most important issue to face humanity that was brought to us through earth science, right? And so if you want to go at it, you have to have a rigorous, solid basis. I've worked at NASA, I work at NOAA, I work with other agencies that all are filled with earth geoscientists who are some of the best, brightest people working on the biggest challenging things there is. And yet, when we go to school, somehow biology by itself and microbiology is where rigor is, or chemistry. And those are incredibly important, and so I don't mean to diminish them, but I do mean to put us in the geosciences on par so that, you know, you can't understand the world without these. And, and to, we ask our students to stop being prepared for these challenges in middle school. It's just not, it's just not right. And I think that one of the real rigorous balances that come with these is one of those balances. Because remember, one of my core points is time. And we just are not putting the time. If you put the time, they master it. But we're not putting the time, and now we're asking that that time be put, finally. <laughs>